Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Stock Talk podcast with Invest Like Mike. Today's going to be a good episode. We're going to talk about a lot of really good topics with someone that you might be familiar with if you're following my group, following my channel. Uh, we're going to be interviewing Mark Lawford today. How are you doing, Mark? Very good. How are you, Mike? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, we're going to be going over a number of different topics with Mark today. If you followed our videos, we get a lot of good back and forth going on. And, um, you know, it's nice to be able to get someone else's perspective who's been doing it. And uh, we're going to go over a variety of topics. How's everything going with you, Mark? Uh, you've been uh, pretty busy, I guess. Yeah, no, pr pretty busy. Um, buying some real estate, selling some real estate. Um, obviously, I'm a real estate agent. Uh, YouTube's going pretty well. Yeah, so just just busy generally, and then obviously family, kids, all that fun stuff, and new new lockdown today. Yeah. Eh. I know, I know, I know. Um, you know what? The weather's getting a little better outside, and I think that in the coming couple months, life could get a little better. But um, in the meantime, we do what we got to do, right? Yep. So that's okay. Now you recently hit thirty five hundred uh, YouTube uh, followers, thirty five hundred subscribers. Yeah. Okay. So it's the Mark Loeffler experience on YouTube. If anyone wants to check it out, we'll put it in the in the links and everything, and uh, get them over four thousand there. Yeah, um, the, the the real goal for that, to be honest with you, is to get over eighty percent retention per per um, video. So that's on me to create better quality that people just want to listen to. So yeah, no, that's good. That's good. And you've been uh, going at it really consistently and kind of fitting in these videos in between your busy busy schedule too. Yeah, well, we did. We were doing. Um, three a week. Now we're taking it down to two just to be able to provide more quality. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's the thing is that when you're doing this, like even today for our conversation, we have some specific topics we're going to go over. If I had to talk to you again later this week or next week, I'd have to come up with some new topics. That's right. And you know, that's part, that's part of it. But uh, the market is providing us with new topics for today's discussion. So for sure, uh, that's what we're going to get into before we get into the specifics, because I'm sure everyone wants to talk about the, uh, the stimulus and everything like that. Um, why don't we just get into for folks that maybe haven't followed our videos uh, the whole way and just to give a little intro for you. Uh, what's been your stock market journey? Like for me, I started in my 20s. I started reading books in 2006. I was part of the 2008 crash. What's your journey? What's your journey been uh, in stocks way before options? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, so, I mean, in stocks, I mean, when I was I don't know, eight or 10 years old. I was interested in the stock market and my grandparents got me BCE shares. Oh, wow. So and for, for Christmas and, and my birthday, I got shares in, in Bell Canada. And then I just had those on a drip and they're still actually on a drip. I haven't actually even touched those shares because they're actually in share format. And I'm just like, I don't know where the shares are. And I, I could go get them and, and figure that out. But I'm just like, ah, whatever. Just let them sit there and continue to go and grow and Okay. And now when you were a teenage, like, did, did you start investing in stocks either in your twenties or in your teenage years? Or? Yeah. So I was doing some, not day trading, but like a penny stocks and, and that in the twenties and then uh, early twenties and then 20 or er, like mid twenties, everything went to real estate. And then I got to early thirties, mid thirties. And I was like, wow, I got way too much in real estate. I'm a real estate agent. My portfolio, I have a decent sized portfolio. I'm a really, um, I'm doing private lending. So if the real estate market tanks, I'm pretty screwed. So I was like, okay, I need other options. And then that's where, and I started, that's when I met Omar and I started doing options trading. So you basically looked at it as a way of diversifying your investments, basically from the sound of it. That's correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before you jumped into stocks, I mean, you were doing penny stocks so already. That's speculative. Was your opinion that stocks in general were speculative or was your focus just on real estate? Focus was mainly just on real estate because you could buy cash flow in real estate with, you know, back then you get 100% financing on a fourplex, right? So, yeah, on a 40 year yeah. AM. So the thing cash flowed like you wouldn't believe with no money down. Okay. Now, did you, days. <laughs> were you part of the 2008 crash or did you start investing into them after that? I, I started investing after that. Like I was in real estate in 2008 crash, but I was not in, in uh, stocks. I mean, I, I remember buying uh, Ford shares in my wife's RSPs at $1. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and then we just rode that up to like eight bucks and got out. So that's awesome. Okay. Now, did you have any people, whether it was uncles or friends around you or people that 
um maybe historically we're telling you like you know the market just crashed you should get in did you have any of that in your life no you didn't end up having that influence okay no nope. uh did you have more real estate influence is that why you got into real estate i mean i just saw that so my grandfather didn't nobody owned rental properties but they owned properties and you know from you see that they bought something for ten thousand dollars and now it's worth you know three hundred thousand right? Over, so you, over the course of 20 years, 25 years, like, well, that's a pretty good return. Okay. So you experienced that you got, you got some exposure to that and you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's you see for me, it was funny when I went to Brock university here, uh, we started renting from, uh, it's actually one of my electricians. I still know him. Um, and you know, we were thinking to ourselves, geez, five of us guys here were paying $2,000 a month for this little wartime home. that was probably worth a hundred grand. And we're thinking, geez, you know, they probably put a thousand dollars in their pocket every month. And it started being something that you realize that, you know, you can go to work for a paycheck, but it's nice to think about uh, alternate sources of income. Yes. Yeah, having your money work for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good thing. Now um, in terms of stocks, you ended up going beyond just shares and things like that. And you actually got into uh, stock options. Um, I have a book here behind me that uh, I've read through and gone through a course as well. Um, what, you know, you were already someone that was investing in and obviously profiting from stocks. Uh, how did stock options, uh, seem to you initially when you didn't know anything about them and then how do you view them, you know, years later now? So like back then, I, like I wasn't, I have a, I didn't have an account. I didn't even have, um, a, a, a market account. I might've had like an RBC with some small amount of money in, or my wife's, um, RSP that I was just playing with. Uh, so I really wasn't doing anything in stocks. And then, uh, I got introduced to it, um, as a way to make two to 3% a month. Okay. Okay. And like, that's, uh, you know, that's obviously a very good cash on cash return. You can do, if you get 2% a month, that's 30% a year. And you compound that annually. And that adds up while you're compounding it monthly, daily, really. Right. So true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I interviewed Ben Gallagher recently, and I mean, he posted public returns. I think he averaged 18% a year for over 20 years. It, it might not sound, like some people think that doesn't sound like much because recently their experiences, you can make that in like a day, yeah. but that's not normal. And you shouldn't expect for your lifetime to make insane stock returns nonstop. So to make 20% even compounded over the long term is a massive number. And a lot of people, I, I don't know if they realize that. Yeah. Well, I mean, people, well, people obviously underestimate what they can do in the short term and overestimate what they can do, or sorry, the other overestimate one. what they can do in the short term, underestimate what they can do in the long term. And that's when it comes to investing. And that's why, you know, uh, most of these things are, if you just um, put the money in every month and let it grow and let it compound, it's going to grow over time. Right. Well, the thing that's is the to, if, if someone just invested in Tesla, let's say at around $500, and then all of a sudden it went to almost $900, they might think, you know, geez, I can make 40, 50% in a few months. That's not normal. Uh, and, and the markets in the past year is making us feel like it's normal. Yeah. But, um, you know, sometimes you can make that safer number, that safer return more consistently over time. And yeah. I think that, that's, that's something that uh, is important to point out. Um, now, getting into that, I want to talk about strategy and the importance of strategy, because as we just said, the past year, I think we kind of view this as a gift. And for the next even few months, we're probably expecting more of a gift coming up here with the market, but it's not normal. It's definitely not something that's uh, normal for the market to roar as much as it has been. I don't know if you disagree with that. How do you feel about the past year? I mean, it's been stupid, but I mean, they're printing money, right? Yeah. They're, that's it's, uh, it's going somewhere and you can see where it's going. And, and I mean, you know, we're going to get into the topic of inflation later uh, as well, because this all ties together. And uh, it's part of the reason why we invest in real estate and all kinds of different things. Um, now, in terms of strategy, um, beyond just, you know, buying things and holding them, so to speak, for no specific reason, uh, what, do you, what have you been doing in terms of strategy? Because we've had money printing, We've had COVID, we've had elections, we've had all these things going on. Uh, have you been kind of a spectator or how, how have you incorporated strategy into the investing? 
Um, so, I mean, I was probably a naked put seller up until last, last March. And then from there, I've become a buyer of calls. Um, I, I'll hold more stock now. Like uh, my, my thing is I'm probably 40% puts 30% long holds where I'm just selling calls on them mm-hmm. and 30% uh, buying calls. Okay. So you've diversified your, your option portfolio. Yeah. And it, and it's more just for the simple fact that I'm not a day trader. I'm not going to sit here and look at it every day. I'm not going to look at it. Like I, I maybe spend 10 or 15 minutes on it a day. Like I look at nine 30, um, I do a couple of things. And then again, I'm off doing other things, right. I'm living my life. I I'm, I'm not very good if I have to stare at a computer screen. So. Well, that's not, no. And you, you know what, you have multiple streams of income. That's the other thing nowadays is that uh, it, you know, if you rely on a singular job, that's fine, but it's just, it seems like nowadays it's nice to diversify your income um, if you can, because, you know, something like COVID happens. Uh, I know a lot of student landlords, it's not that great of a time to be a student landlord right now compared to before. So what else do you have? Well, and, and, and that's what they were saying. Like that was the recession proof one, right? I, right. I never got into student land or student um, rentals just for this. I mean, I didn't, I always thought there was too much work, but well, they say it's re- recession proof because if times are bad, like 2008 in America, school. you go back to school to do something else now, right? So, yeah. um, but not when COVID happens because, uh, you know, anything with a large gathering shut down here in Canada. So, um, you know, you have to have some diversity, I think, in your income. And part of it can be stocks and stock options. If your business was failing in the past year, maybe your stock portfolio outperformed, which it did. And that could actually help offset some of the losses you had. So it's kind of nice to have some of that diversity. Now, in terms of strategy, like, you know, me and you, we've worked together and I've showed you a lot of charting and we've gone back and forth on a bunch of stuff, probably for the past like six or eight months, I'd say. Um, so we kind of went through the election together, right? We were being yep. patient during the election. We went all in after the election. And then we were telling other people and amongst ourselves, that when we entered after the election, that January, February would be a good time to take profits if we experienced a nice rally. And uh, the reason why we did that is because cyclically, a lot of people, uh, your friend Omar talks about that, a lot of people have talked about that, but the average person has no idea possibly. And um, how have you, how important is strategy? Like, is that something you would have done years ago or have you been using more strategy in recent years? Yeah. I mean, every time I, like I learned something new, I, I sorry, bug. Um, <laughs> yeah, every time I, I learned something new, I just add it to the playbook. Right. So um, definitely watch looking at charts more, um, you know, um, so to enter, to, to set closes, to, um, and, you know, even to set up my trades, like, it's like, okay, here's, here, here's a resistance line. Here's, you know, um, so like, and then, and I'll trade those for sure. Like I'll sell puts on them. So if the market's falling, I'm like, okay, let's, let's watch the broader market. And then let's watch where there's some resistance on here. And then I can, I can enter a position and if like a quarter position, and then if it goes farther down, I can enter in another position type thing. Right. So. So do you kind of make the assumption that you're not going to be able to call the bottom or the top? So you're kind of doing it in multiple stages sometimes. Yeah. So like the last one where it dropped out of the channel there for a day or day or two, like I didn't hit the bottom after it dropped the channel. I was in back in the next day type thing. Right. So I, um, yeah. Um, or the second nope, one, the second one there. So second. I got in on that second candle again. Right. Okay. And then wrote it up. And now then I've been, written it up. It's been going up again. You know, I wanted to, uh, right now for any listeners, I'm just showing the chart here. Um, if I zoom out, we've been watching this channel, Mark. Literally, if you go back on Mark's YouTube channel, we did videos about this rally when it initially spiked up. And remember all the videos we did showing this channel? Look at it. It's still, other than a couple spots where it just went below there, we're still in the channel. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny how that works. And then right here... Um, I had done a, a video and I was working with some coaching students where I said, Hey, I just went towards uh, cash. And I believe Mark, I think me and you were talking about it. Yep. And, uh, what did, did you, I think you told me you actually went towards cash here. Too, I was right? 90% cash there. Yeah. I had some long holdings that I kept. 
So you didn't get harmed that badly by the drop? No. Okay. And then you got in and experienced some of the rally since then. What did you do when you, okay, so when the market kind of peaked out and me and you and some other people went to cash and we got lucky that it fell right away, it doesn't mean that we um, knew it would fall the next day or anything, right, Mark? But we we okay. got lucky that it dropped right away on, and we were not fully in. What was your strategy after that? Because some people want to, you know, get right back in right away or they wait too long. What was your, your mindset then? So I took three days off. Like literally, I just didn't look at it. Um, and then when I came back in, it kind of hit the bottom of the channel there and I started taking some positions. So I was probably 50% back in. Um, and I, we went up and I took some profits. Um, it started falling after that again. So by the time the next drop was around, I probably was 25% in the market. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I mean, I obviously took a little bit of it, but you know, again, I take long positions, uh, so I'm really not that usually that concerned about like a, a one or two day drop. Uh, like this last one, people, I, I know people in your chat group were like, oh, I'm down 50% on this position. I'm like, yep, me too. But <laughs> I have June expiries on my calls. So I kind of don't care. Well, it's one of those things where if, like, if you have a basket of positions right now, your Microsoft is up, your Scotch Miracle Grow is up, your DraftKings is up but maybe your apples down or maybe your something else is down because it just didn't rally yet. Uh, you could even have something that underperformed in the short term that might rally later. Facebook's been underperforming all year and now it's on an insane rally. So yeah. um, using a longer expiry like you did is safer because we're in uncertain times and we might've used shorter expiries, for example, after the election leading to Christmas because we were very positive uh, about having a new president and then the best sales season of the year was was Christmas. So we, we had more uh, in place. Um, for, for right now, I mean, the way I took it was the same way you did. I took a little bit of time off and I said to people, we have all year to make money. Uh, you don't have to force, you know, putting all your money back in or trying to make money during a time when something might be crashing or something weird might be going on. And it was kind of nice to let things fall and then start taking positions, right? Yep. And um, I think that was a good strategy. If I pull up, I'm gonna pull up another chart here just to show people here. Uh, if you invested in Apple, uh, it's something people consider to be a pretty safe long-term bet because when I zoom out, you can see the big, big uptrend in the chart. It kind of climbs higher all the time. And so this is something that if I get out my measurement tool here, I'm just doing a measurement on trading view. Apple fell approximately just under 20% in the recent drop in the market, just under 20%. And this is considered a blue chip. Uh, athletes like Shaquille O'Neal owned it, probably Ashton Kutcher, Warren Buffett. It's considered a safe long-term hold because even during a calamity or a big drop like recently, it dropped about 20%. And I'll show you more of a speculative play, which is Tesla. And I like Tesla, but recently it went up to almost $900 and then it fell almost 40%, so approximately double what Apple fell. And that's what people talk about when they talk about blue chips and safety and speculative plays is choose wisely. If you go all towards Tesla and EVs and uh, speculative type stocks, well, get ready when they dip because they don't just go up aggressively, they can dip aggressively, right, Mark? Yeah, 100%. So it's one of those things. How do you mix that into your strategy? Do you... Do you take uh, 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 more profits or profits sooner on a speculative play like Tesla, for example? How do you treat those? So on any of my calls that I'm doing, it's typically I'm doing um, I I'm doing 20% um, is my target uh, profit range on that. Um, and that's on any of the stocks, to be honest with you. Speculative, it's actually easier because they, they you know, I really need a 3% move or something like that up um, to, to make that happen three to 4%. Uh, but to be honest, yeah. And then, so on, uh, on options, like if I'm doing uh, sorry, if I'm selling call or selling puts, then I'm taking profits at like, if I hit 30% in a day, I take the profits. So okay. I saw like, I sold Palantir this morning. If it goes, if it hits 30% today, I'm out. Um, you know, and then regularly I'm just taking 50, like profits on 50%. Whereas typically on like something like an Apple, I, I'll hold it till 80. 
And, and, oh, okay. So you're you're willing to hold for more decay on your uh, naked puts because yeah. Apple's safer to hold, so to speak. Well, it's going to have less downside risk, right? So if I if I sell a 120 Apple today or whatever, and I have to own Apple at 120, that's fine. I, I, I make my couple of dollars, my one, two percent. So my average cost is 117. I'll sell 120, 122 calls on it all day long. And I'll sit there and collect whatever minuscule dividend they give me. Yeah, well, for just as an example, and that's a good one. Apple, um, before the drop happened, uh, a lot of people were picking that 120, 125 strike because Apple was 140, 145. And that was the strike they picked. When it fell, it did go below 120. It went to 115 or something like that. But if you really had to pay 120, even if it, even if the stock was 110 and you're paying 120, right? If you're at the end of that contract, at the end of the day, Apple is basically going to go above that again unless something fundamentally changes. So you, you feel confident with that company. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And even in March, when Apple fell towards $80, $90, it came back to 140 and um, it, it's a nice thing like that. With Tesla, if you sold puts at 750 or 800, you had to watch it go to 550 almost. Yeah. So I, I haven't. Um, so I bought calls on Tesla when it hit 540. Okay. And then it bounced back up and I got out and I got the, I got my rally up to 20%. Now, if I had held it the next day, because it went to like 650 or something, would have made a heck of a lot more. But, you know, I made my money. I was happy, made my 20% in very short time. Like, so if you can say that and you're out, why not? Right. Now, how do you, how do you manage the emotions of that? Because a lot of people, if they, if they were to get out of something and then for the next two, three days, it goes up much more, you feel like, oh, I should have stayed in. Uh, but if you're in on something and it drops all of a sudden, and you didn't take your profits, you'll say to yourself, oh, I should have taken profits. How do you balance that out? Listen, I had over a million dollars worth of Tesla at around $2 and $10, $210 average price um, before the split. Right. So right. if I don't worry about that, I'm not going to worry about 50 bucks on a stock move or something <laughs> like that. So like, that's what, $20 million US right oh, now? Like, it, it's, it, it, yeah, you can't play those games, right? If you're going to play those games, you shouldn't be. Here. The share price uh, from what Mark's saying, I believe they did a, a split. I think the stock should be worth two, three thousand dollars if it was priced. It would be, I think it's like three thirty, three hundred right now. If that's yeah, so it's it was yeah. fifteen times. There you go, okay. fifteen or sixteen times. Wow, yeah, and I mean that's the Kathy Wood approach. She's just been holding it, right? Um, yeah. But so, did, did you have you just taken the approach that uh, stocks will go up after you sell them, or maybe they will go down, but you don't concern yourself with that? Once I'm out, I don't worry about it. Okay. It's like a new day. It's now, like you're, you're, it's if you're a golfer, you hit a bad shot, gives a shit. Next shot, just worry about the next <laughs> shot, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, same, yeah. It's the exact same thing. Just worry about your next trade. Now, do you have, like, I know you said you split up your portfolio. So, for example, um, I own some Bitcoin and some stuff that I'm just kind of holding longer term. And I have some options I set up with longer expiries to hang on to longer. Do you have anything that you kind of just, hang on to in terms of your options or shares or anything like that so i got one company it's called ecom but basically i got those shares because the company i own true local got taken over by it and i've just bought more shares over to, over the time so okay. i own a fair amount of shares of that and i'm going to get more as buyouts come by there's a two-year hurdle thing so okay um now when you see some companies make tremendous runs up are you not so concerned with that because you're able to consistently make money the way you're making it and you prefer that rather than hoping on a big rally? Because we yeah. you'll you'll will miss out on some big rallies if you're taking profits along the way, as you just said with Tesla, right? Yeah. I, I I'm fine with that, you know. So yeah. Like um, okay. yeah. I, I mean if you, I, I, I listen, if I can if you can make 30% consistently, at the end of the day, that's all you need to do. I don't need to make a hundred, two hundred percent a year. Right, right. I mean, and if you if 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 you got ten thousand dollars in the market, learn how to trade and get, you know, three thousand or thirty percent consistently, twenty percent consistently. If you can do that, you're going to win long term. And then you just keep adding money in. I tell people that every day. You know, put ten thousand dollars in your trading account. Learn, 
And then every month, add how much you can, add $1,000, add $500, whatever that is, just keep adding that money in so it grows over time. And the nice thing is too that, um, you know, we don't know when some bad news article will come out. These are the other day, some lawsuit came up and they started tanking. I mean, who knew that was going to happen? Oh, see, um, when, when, that, when stuff like that happens, I usually do trades on them. For sure. Because it makes volatility. I'll sell puts at a, at a resistance level, support level. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is too, that because we've seen it so often where, you know, a rally will go up and it'll fade and then sometimes it'll go up more. Sometimes it'll drop more. You can't really pick a top, so to speak. And because of that, if you don't exit for profits at a certain point, you have to create your own system and your own threshold. If you don't do that, you literally don't have control. You're at the mercy of the market. And the way you're doing it, you're saying, if I hit that 20, 30% mark, I'm now controlling my investment and I'm taking that profit. Yeah. Right. So I think that that's a way to actually have more control of the investment. And if you miss out on a rally, guess what? You'll find another opportunity like Visa recently. They're, they're like buses, right? Another one will come along in a couple of minutes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I agree with all that. I mean, I think that's why I wanted to go over strategy because strategy is very important. And even just the way that people handled the recent dip, uh, if you weren't preparing to be holding some cash or taking profits after that big rally we had for about three months uh, in a row, then you're at the mercy of the markets, right? And we were actually, when we entered after the election in November, our plan was always to be exiting in the new year, because like you just said, another bus always comes along. Yep. Right? So that's, uh, that's a good way to do it. Um, okay. Now, let me, let me ask you a question because uh, a lot of people started investing after the COVID drop. And uh, Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports, there's celebrities on CNBC that have trading accounts and they're publicly trading. Everyone's doing it now. There's Robinhood uh, trading. People are buying fractions of shares now, putting their stim stimulus checks into the, I think they're calling it their stimmy. Uh, they're, they're putting their stimmy checks in there. Is that so, what they call it? I'm not, I'm not, down, I'm not down with the lingo. <laughs> Apparently it's a stimmy. Um, All right. So, uh, and then there's stonks, I think. I don't even know. Stonks. What that is. Yeah, I know about stonks. Yeah. <laughs> now, it, it basically, people have made the assumption that if you put your money into Bitcoin or the markets or anything, you're just going to make money. Okay. Seems like that's the, the mentality right now. Even the stimulus checks go in there. It seems like it basically it's too good to be true. Um, if you're a long-term investor and you've been through a bunch of ups and downs, that just sounds silly to assume it will always go up uh how do you how do you feel about that because with real estate people use that analogy but in canada we haven't had a really meaningful dip since i think 1990 unless you live so, in Windsor. so well i know you're thinking about ontario in ontario <laughs> sorry yeah. I, yes because i mean i'm now investing in alberta and they are actually just they they had a, a little bit of a dip last year right um they've had yeah. dips over and over again yeah um because they're boom and bust economy a little bit more because of um, oil. Yeah, oil. Yeah, oil. Yeah. But um, yeah. So back to the original question about, you know, obvi obviously, sometimes so at some point, the, they're going to stop pr the, the presses of, of cash and the money flow is going to come back to a normal trend line. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it's, I mean, if you watch Alessio Overstrani, he's talking about deflation rather than inflation. Mm hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think he's taking a longer term view because what you just said is true. Like, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, uh, I want to be mindful of COVID, but I really think that getting the vaccines and everything we're doing, it should get better from here. I think I don't know that we're going to need trillions and trillions more printed for years. I said that in January and look, we're locking down again. So I know, I know, but I, I just, I, I you know, maybe I'm uh, too optimistic, but I'm, I'm an optimistic guy too. So I yeah, get it. I think it's going to get better, but I just, I don't think we're going to keep needing Joe Biden to give out another 2 trillion and another two, maybe one more, but maybe none, you know? Yeah. It's, well, I mean, so many States are open now. I mean, look, they had 40,000 people at a game in Texas, right? Florida's wide open. I mean, but they're seeing a surge in cases. So I know, I know it's a, it's a little bit tricky. I think at some point, whether it be in six months or 16 months, they're not going to be printing big amounts of money anymore. That's obviously not going to happen for the next 10 years. So uh, 
I think that a lot of people might not realize that this, the surge we've seen, two things. Uh, the market dropped a lot initially in March. So already you have a lot of ground to make up because it just crashed, right? Well, I, was the, I think it was the biggest, it was the quickest drop ever. Ever, the quickest ever. drop in history. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that the 2008 drop started in late 2007 and it did not complete until March of 2009. It was almost a year and a half. And um, the, recent, the recent drop in March last year was only a few weeks. Yeah. Right. So, um, but I think that the reason why we've had such a ferocious rally is because we dropped so much. We had to make that back up. Yeah. Right? We had the V-shaped recovery. And then we have all this money printing and all the money printing, right? So the dollar devaluation. Um, and that kind of leads into my next topic here because, you know, when me and you have been talking and over the years, even Alessio Rostani and a lot of people were talking about dollar devaluation, when that money gets printed, to kind of put a band-aid over something and it's not furthering the economy in any way. It's just like a, uh, a life preserver, basically. It's kind of like you're taking on bad debt or you're raising your credit card limit. And the, the US dollar is negatively impacted by all of this money printing right now. And I know that you've mentioned that. Has that been a driving force behind your investments? Do you think about that actively? I mean, I think about it. Um, I don't really... I mean, I don't know when the spigot's going to get shut off, right? And I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to prognosticate on when that's going to happen or when it's not going to happen. And I, I'm literally just going to take advantage of what's going on in front of me. And I, and again, when something changes, I will then shift again. Well, the nice thing is that, you know, even if you're not following inflation or if you don't even know that, money printing does what it does when they when they printed that money last april you saw the markets take off and right now there's been a lag period but stocks have just kind of started running up in the past week or two here depending on what you own and i believe that will continue you'll see it in the market right that's kind of what you're saying is that you will actually see the activity you will hear it from other people and uh, cnbc is talking about it so you kind of you're, you're listening and you're absorbing basically. Yeah. I mean, the gate, the GameStop stuff, right? Like everybody and their brother was like, and sister and whoever <laughs> like, Oh, I'm going to buy GameStop and we're going to take down wall street. I'm like, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, slow your roll. But okay. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was interesting. Wall street bets. And, uh, I forget what the other company was. Oh, the Reddit, all oh, the Reddit. Well, Reddit's what it's wall street bets on wet Reddit. So yeah. On Reddit. And so basically a bunch of people collectively came together, mostly young people, I think. I'm sure there was a variety of people, but a lot of young people embraced it. And they all at once bet in favor of a stock that these big companies and hedge funds were shorting, right? And they yeah. tried to kind of do the Robin. Well, they did a short squeeze on them. Yeah, they did a short squeeze. They tried to take from the rich and give to the poor. But then at the end of it, I think a lot of those people got hurt because of the way things played out, you know? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately... Um, now, I, I'm just going to pull up a, a quick chart here for the listeners. I'm just going to pull up the, the DXY chart, and that's the US dollar index here. Uh, so you can see recently, Mark, that they printed the money, and then actually the US dollar value went up a little bit here. So uh, it's been kind of interesting to see that. When I zoom out on the chart and I go back here to the April stimulus, uh, you'll see that I pointed out that uh, afterwards it kind of went up and it chopped around. And it actually didn't fall off a cliff and drop in value for a few weeks yeah. uh, the, the last time. So right now it's been a couple of weeks and I feel like it's going to roll over still kind of like last time. I think it's just taking a few weeks. Um, if this were to happen, if we see the US dollar drop down again, all of a sudden, it's going to lead to the same type of things that we saw back in June, July last year. We saw stocks running back up again. We saw yeah. Bitcoin running back up again. We saw house prices surging. I believe that that's what's coming, but we'll see. I'm going to wait for the chart to tell me. Um, do you? How do you feel about that in terms of real estate? I mean, with real estate now, we have interest rates dropping and we have dollars being devalued. So, I mean, you're the real estate expert. How has that been since COVID? Um So, I mean, obviously we saw a huge surge when, I mean, they dropped interest rates to near zero. Um, 
I did a video on it where I, I went through, you know, if you had a 6% mortgage compared to a 1% mortgage, like how much of a difference it is. And it's basically a hundred percent difference of what you can afford in a house because most people don't care what they pay for a house. They care what their monthly payments are. Right. Right. Um, and that's what the bank looks at. The bank says you can afford this month, much monthly based on your income. And that's all interest sure. rate driven. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So basically what we've seen lately is we've seen a lot more inventory come on the market at springtime. Um, we see, like I've seen personally in Ontario, less bidding wars. Um, so okay, less, there's still sorry, bidding wars, but less bidding wars now compared to when Mark, like, uh, February. Oh, okay. So we had about a two week period in March last year, where if you bought a house, you were a genius and you're probably up a hundred percent since then, maybe 50, 60%. Okay. And then in April that started eroding. People were like, Oh, this isn't so bad. I, I still have my job, whatever. I can go buy a house. And then obviously through the summer, it was fine through the fall it's really started to get stupid again. And then just November, December, January, February, there was no inventory. There was 50, 60 bids on every house. Everybody I knew, I said, listen, if you're going to sell, now's the time. And then you can buy in, just get a long close. And some people listened to me. Some people didn't. Um, and yeah, they've, they made out like bandits. Now we're not seeing prices fall but we're not seeing the, like the huge, huge increases. Like you can't see 40% year over year. Like that's and crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Like it's just, it's unsustainable. And I mean, people's income, I mean, you're lucky if you get a raise for a few percent and then the value of a house that you want to go purchase is going up 40%. That's well, crazy. it's all interest rate driven, right? Because nobody cares what the price of the house is. They only care about what their monthly payment is. I know. I know. And the interest rates go down. I know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of sad because, you know, we see the discussions about minimum wage going up and everything, and it's, it's fine. People do need uh, to be paid a livable more wage, yeah. to, to keep up with things, but it's, it's the result of inflation and the dollar devaluation that makes it so that even a hamburger at McDonald's is more expensive because everything is more expensive and you, we're going to constantly have to raise the minimum wage. Well, I mean, wage. that's the thing. If you raise minimum wage, the rest of those prices are going to go up. You're chasing your tail. You're chasing right. your tail. And it Which, doesn't mean that uh, I hope I, no, no one thinks me and Mark don't want the minimum wage to go up. It's got to go up. But the reason why it will have to go up indefinitely forever is because we're going to keep, you know, uh, how do you say, causing dollar devaluation, making things more expensive. Well, I mean, that's government policy, right? Yeah. Because they're in debt. And that's how, I mean, if they're in an inflationary environment, then their debt costs less tomorrow than it did today. Do you, uh, you know, I remember being a little kid and I remember, um, you know, in the 80s, I remember my family uh, talking about interest rates a lot. Uh, I come from an Italian background. They, you know, bought their houses in cash if they could or paid them off quick because the interest rates were high. The interest rates were up 18%. Uh, I don't know if you ever had a relative come up to you and kind of jokingly say, oh, you know, you're paying two, 3%. We used to pay you know, 16%. I hear, I hear it all the time. But I mean, right? when I bought my first house, I was paying seven, 7.3% in Toronto. I was six, 6%, I think as well. So I, I've been through that a little bit, right? Yeah. And I think if you're someone who's 25, 30 years old right now, you might not even know that happened. I mean, yeah. it depends on who you're talking to. Um, it's pretty normal to have low interest rates since 2008, pretty much. I mean, that dropped off from 5% down. Yep. Right? So it's kind of one of those things. It's nice to be aware of that stuff because even if you're a real estate investor, if you know these things, interest rates going down along with dollar devaluation is good for items that are measured in dollars at the end yeah. of the day, right? So that's a really important um, topic for me there. Uh, now, just to get into a couple other topics here, um, cryptocurrencies. I know that I've been in on cryptocurrencies for a while and I got in pretty early. I was even in in 2017. Um, I'm pretty sure that when we talked a month or two ago, you said that you were going to start just kind of buying cryptocurrencies either every week or every month. Have you started a position or? No, no, oh, I haven't yet. Um, come on. I know. Uh, it's just setting it all up. I just got to do it. Um, I got the money sitting there to do it. I've been putting the money aside, but I just haven't. Okay. I haven't done it yet. So. Now, do you want, uh, do you want to buy actual cryptos? Cause you could have bought like a uh, grayscale Bitcoin trust or something like that. Oh, I, I mean, I've been doing Mara and um, riot and can and those ones the okay. whole time. Right. Well, at least since riot was $10 and Mara was $8. Right. So um, okay. 
Yeah. So you're involved in it, but you want to get the actual cryptos? I want it. Yeah, that's that's the plan. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe you can keep us up to date on your journey with that because, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that works for you. And um, can I ask you why you're interested in cryptos? Uh, I mean, a lot of people just use like gold as a hedge or something like that. And it's just one of those things to just have as a, I don't even know. Well, Elon Musk just did it, right? Uh, who cares? But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just one of those things, right? It's like, it, it's again, you take a small portion of your net worth and you put it into something like that, right? Like, it's not like it's going to be the majority of my net worth or, or a very big like portion of my income. Um, and I put it in there that that's, that's what I'm like, basically what, what's going to happen. Actually, you know, what I should do is I should take all my uh, YouTube money and put it into there. That's uh that would be a good trade off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, all a couple hundred dollars worth. <laughs> we'll have to click some more of your videos there um, yeah. I'm just showing on screen here the big short investor Michael Burry is saying we have to prepare for inflation there's economists and people warning about inflation I think a lot of Bitcoin investors and stock market investors are kind of hoping that there is inflation because it'll inflate the value of their assets I and think anybody who's who's investing with debt right now is hoping for inflation so yeah definitely definitely um and again you know elon musk is hedging uh jim kramer's hedging all these people are buying a few percent or whatever it is instead of gold uh, or on top of gold right so i mean is is elon musk really hedging or is he setting up like he's like they're they're allowing people to buy in in um bitcoin now right so cars, yeah. you you for for something like that to happen, you need a steady supply of Bitcoin, so it's you're basically hedged, right? It's like it's like the oil, it's like the futures market, right? If you're if you're buying or selling wheat, like you're, and so you sell into that market. Sure. Whereas yeah. Bitcoin's so volatile, you basically need to have a store there so you can accept it. And I think that's more what's happening than Elon saying, "Hey, this is a great investment." I think he's saying, "Hey." If we're going to accept Bitcoin as payment and we can process it, we need to have it on 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 file here. Basically. You need an account with in, to deposit it into, essentially. Yeah, well, right. an account to deposit it in. Plus, we need to have it as a store value. We need yeah. to have that here, so that we're not getting killed one day to the next. You know, somebody buys the, buys it when Bitcoin's at sixty thousand dollars and Bitcoin goes down to fifty. Well, right. they're getting 20% off the price of the car. And the thing is with Bitcoin, I mean, uh, I wrote it up all the way to 44,000 in January. And then I just, I'm a long-term investor. So I'm holding that. I have other things I'm trading like you are in the market. But when it went to 44,000, it then dropped to 29,000, which is a massive drop. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if someone just bought in at that time and they weren't used to being a Bitcoin investor, they were freaking out. And oh, yeah. For me, I've seen, I've been through that a bunch of times now. So I've got thick skin and I'm used to that, but it's not for the, it's not for the weak of heart, right? With cryptocurrency, it's not for the weak of heart. Yeah. A lot of it's that, that for me, that's said and forget it. Right. Yeah, I think you have to treat Bitcoin like Tesla. Like when, when Tesla was flying up, I said to people, pick your number. I said, you don't know if it's going to 800, a thousand. You have no idea where the top's going to be. Pick your number and be happy with it at a certain point. Or you got to use the Kathy Wood approach. Just set it, forget it, and yep. hope, they, hope they succeed in the next couple of years. Yeah. Right? That, that's pretty much the only way to, to, to do it because it will be a volatile ride. So. Well, I mean, she was rebalancing some of her portfolio when uh, Tesla was over 900, right? Like she was selling. For sure. For she sure. didn't sell a lot, but she sold some and then she picked it back up. Cheaper. Yep. Yeah. Much cheaper. Much cheaper. Yeah. So, uh, one other one other thing I want to touch on with you, and I don't know how much you looked into it, but I mean, just as a spectator of CNBC and stocks, um, I want to talk about NFTs. And it might be a subject that some people listening might say, what the heck is that? And in 2017, no one knew what Bitcoin was. Uh, do you know, first of all, do you know what NFTs are? Very preliminary. I, I have no idea, really. It's like art. People are paying millions of dollars for. I don't, that's, that's digital. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it's digital. So I had a friend of mine um, contact me uh, two, three weeks ago, and 
uh, he started, he's an artist, okay? He has one of those tablets where it's set up on an angle, like a drafting table, and he is an artist. He actually draws on them, and then you can print off or digitally view your art. You don't have to paint like Picasso on canvas anymore. It's digital if you want. And so there's people that have the ability to say, I created this piece of art. Mark, you can buy it from me for $1,000, and now you own my art, okay? Mm -hmm. And they send it to you in the same way that I might send you a, a Bitcoin. So it's, it's a secure transfer of the art and you get my art and you own my art, okay? So in that way, it actually kind of makes sense. I guess if you, if you want digital art, you're gonna buy it digitally and safely, right? Yeah. But then what they're doing is you can, you can buy uh, a dunk of LeBron James dunking the basketball, okay? And it's like a really good dunk, but someone recently paid $208,000 for LeBron James dunking a basketball. And essentially what you get uh, for viewers here, I'm just showing Mark on the screen. Um, you get this thing on your phone or your TV. It looks like this cube that rotates kind of like the big overhead uh, box at the center ice of a hockey game. And on one side, you see the dunk video. On another side, you see the Lakers logo. And it's this digital kind of hockey card or whatever you want to call it. And to me, I don't get that because when I go on YouTube, I can watch that dunk a thousand times and pay zero dollars for it. And there's probably championship DVDs that have the dunk on it. I don't, I don't know if I'm just an old man and I don't get it. Well, yeah, I mean, that that's, I'm, I'm older than you, so I, I get it less. I didn't even know that. I don't, I don't follow it. I mean, some people post in a group that I'm in that people are doing it or whatever, but uh, it's fine. I listen, I'm, I'm not a big art collector anyways. So uh, I, I'm, I'm even less for on the NFT front. So, well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. The reason why I bring it up is just because it's not something everyone's talking about the same way I was talking about Bitcoin four or five years ago. And I'll tell you, like I'm posting in my group about it. I don't, I'm not invested. I'm not buying a dunk video. I'm not doing any of that, but you know, I do think it's going to keep going up. And even though I think it's silly, I used to think cryptos were silly too. And at the end of the day, I'm seeing Michael Jordan started investing recently. Uh, Paris Hilton sold a bunch of stuff. The Weeknd, who's a very popular artist, he just, sold, he just sold some unreleased music, some brand new music he made. Some guy just bought it for 2.5 million right from him. Uh, does he have the rights to then distribute it is that i don't know but it's he's on record maybe, maybe he had to split it with the record company but 2.5 million dollars for unreleased songs he didn't have to market them there was no advertising no touring no interviews he just sold it for 2.5 million uh kings of leon they're selling their album using they'll send it to you on a crypto um you have ashton kutcher and mark cuban who have been on shark tank they're doing an nft shark tank so on April 21st, I saw that. Yeah. Was that gonna, you posted that on your group? I posted it, right? Like, and so they're going to let you pitch all your ideas of NFTs to them. And then they're going to invest in a bunch of them and make money uh, selling NFT. NFT means non fungible token, which yeah. basically means a crypto. And they're sending you these things. So they're thinking, you know, Pearl Jam might sell concert tickets this way. WWE may, might let, let you watch a video of, uh, Hulk Hogan slamming Andre the Giant or something, but you might have to pay a half a million dollars for it. And apparently Marvel and Star Wars, uh, all these companies, uh, apparently M MLB and NFL are already lining up because it's only the NBA so far. Even though I think it's silly, I just wanted to talk about it because I think it's something we're going to be talking about more. Fair enough. So we will see. We will see. Um, Anything else you want to talk about, Mark? Did you want to maybe give us... Uh, I saw you post the other day. Check out the Mark Loeffler experience uh, on YouTube there. Are you... You're going to buy 200 units this year? That's the goal. How are you so going to do from that? from end of March till December, we're going to, I'm going to buy 200 units. Um, combination of Alberta and the US. And well, if I can find something in Ontario, I'll buy in Ontario too. I'm not discounting that. It's just, it's getting tougher to buy here. So uh, yeah. I don't know. Now, did you, um, are you focused? I know you just recently took a trip out to, I think, Calgary. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, Edmonton, I'll, in Calgary. Yeah. Edmonton and Calgary. Are you focused on that region for a specific reason? Is that, is that something that is a long-term plan for you? I mean, so it's a boom and bust economy. I think they're just coming out of the bust. Um, 
Uh, and that's, yeah. And that's really, and that, that, and the fact that their landlord tenant rules are way better than ours. So is part of the reason why you want to invest too, because, uh, you know, with the COVID shutdown, oil usage went way down. The price of oil went way down. Are you kind of saying, well, you know, real estate's a long-term investment. If I'm in there for three to five years, we'll probably have good oil prices again. Yeah. It's obviously a recovery play too. Right. So Okay. Yeah. I think oil prices are going to go up a little bit. I don't know that we're going to go that much higher than the 60, but you know, at 60, 70, $80 oil out there makes a heck of a lot of sense. We're not going to, I don't think we're going to see the, whatever, when, whenever that huge run up the $120 oil, when you could go out there, you're 18 years old and get a job making 200 grand a year. Um, I think that's those times have changed, but I think it's definitely going to improve out there for sure. Now, if someone out there is listening uh, that is into real estate, and I know you do videos about it, but um, it probably sounds intimidating to listen to someone who's buying apartment buildings. The average investor is buying homes or they don't even own maybe investment properties. Uh, what, what would you say to someone who's kind of starting out, but maybe likes the idea of apartment buildings? How do you get to that, to that goal? Uh, buy a lot of duplexes. Uh, um, so all the duplexes buy an apartment building. It's, it's monopoly, right? Four greenhouses, fifth greenhouse is a hotel. Buy a hotel. Okay. Yeah. And so basically it's something that if you, if you don't have a lot of capital, you have to work your way up there by using some smaller pieces on the board. Either and that or, or OPM, right? Other people's money, either you're borrowing private money or you're doing joint ventures or whatever that is. So, and, and to be honest with you, the majority of the properties I buy in Alberta will be joint ventured. Okay. Okay. So you're going to have some partners helping finance and everything like that. Um, now, if someone watches your YouTube videos, you, you do something that is referred to as burring and yeah. you'll burr an apartment building. Uh, sometimes I, th I think that yourself and other people I know, cause I'm in property management too. Some, a lot of people are buying buildings that some other people would never want to walk into sometimes. Uh, what's your strategy behind buying uh, a building that might have problems or problem tenants uh, in it? Um, yeah, I mean, so I don't buy as much crap as I used to. I, I prefer to buy nicer buildings now and okay. then just renovate the units and not have the issues. Um, but the strategy is, I mean, it, it's the same as buying a, a, a crappy do like a bungalow and turning it into a duplex. You're just adding value. And on a commercial building, a multi-residential apartment, it's all based on the cap rate. So um, every dollar that you can increase the net income, which is either raising the gross income of the rent or decreasing the expenses, uh, it makes you money. And that's what the banks look at and that's how they finance it. So that's, that's all I'm doing with these. So if there's, if I can raise the net income enough, then I will buy the building. And I, I kind of like how you, you started that because, uh, when I started managing properties, I would just manage whatever anyone would give me even if it was a rougher property, you know, when you're starting out, you, you do what you got to do, right? You mop the floors if you need to, you do what you got to I was cutting grass. I was doing yeah. everything. As time moves on, you should become more choosy and add uh, better quality. And typically you'll have more experience at that point, more connections, and, um, you know, maybe even a team of people behind you helping you out, which is the case probably with you there. So it's nice to have that progression and to find out, what should I be targeting? What should I be avoiding? And you, you, you learn that through experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you, it's the same thing with options, right? You, you change your strategy over time sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Well, you the evolve, Tesla, you get more mature. The recent Tesla dropped, like I said, it dropped double what Apple dropped. If someone loved Tesla before they might, you know, think a little differently on how they're going to view it going forward. Cause maybe they didn't experience a 40% drop before. Right. Yeah. So it's one of those things. Okay. Well, listen, thanks for taking the time with me here. We went over a lot of topics here. Um, hopefully in the next month or two, we're going to experience a nice rally up. Yeah, and uh, nice. if, if the market goes up for two or three months in a row, let's not be shy to keep some cash on the sidelines, I think. At that point. Yeah, for sure. Right. So we're, we're yeah. getting back to that point again, where I'm probably going to sit on some cash because we're, I'm looking at that 4,100 mark on, on uh, the S&P and uh, that, that's, I'm going to start going to cash at that point. So. Okay. Well, that's, uh, you know, there's going to be, what do they say? It's a staircase on the way up, right? So yep. uh, it's not going to go up in a straight line. And some people feel stocks have already gone up and they've missed out. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think we're going to, we're, we're going to still keep moving uh, right now. I think we're still going to stay in that bull trend.
I do too. Actually, if you look at my group recently, Tom Lee from uh, CNBC said we're going to go on a face ripper rally. And there's a lot of people expecting uh, the stimulus will have an effect on the market. It's been, you know, pretty tame up until a week ago. And yeah. now I think we're going to go into the real rally. Thing, so. Perfect. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. So, okay, Mark, thanks for coming out and uh, enjoy the rest of your week over there. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Take care. Bye.